Great. Uh, welcome to Tennessee. Um, I'm very pleased to be with, with people who aren't interested in disposing of bodies. So thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so uh, we now have uh, Dr. Andreas Korn um, from UCL talking about the hunt for unknown particles. He works on a project that's notorious for the number of authors when they publish anything. It makes my life a right pain. Thanks so much. Thank you, for, thank you for coming and to allow me to speak about some things that I care about, meaning uh, elementary particles. Full disclosure, I am a particle physicist, and if people sort of ask me, what, what do you do? Um, if I'm sort of in a good mood, I will tell them I'm recreating the conditions of the Big Bang. If I'm sort of in a more uh, sort of standard mood, I will actually admit I'm trying to make code compile. And I'll see a little bit, a bit how things go. Okay. So uh, what do I want to tell you about? Well, first a little bit, little bit of history, because if I want to talk about um, hunting known particles, I have to tell you which particles are actually known, and are there any recent discoveries that we have made? And also the, the big question, the big open question is, where do we go from, from uh, uh, where we are? Okay. So uh, what are the particles that we know? Well. Being at EMF, I suspect uh, um, a lot of that is, is known to you already. So if you take any piece of matter, there are molecules in there. So those molecules are held together. Uh, um, actually, or these molecules are made out of, out of atoms. And an atom is nothing but a nucleus surrounded by electrons. We also know that the nucleus actually is made up out of uh, various protons and neutrons. And in fact, since a while, we know that even neutrons and, and, and uh, um, protons are not elementary particles. They are made up out of smaller particles, uh, which we call quarks. In particular, um, the proton is made up out of two U quarks, two up quarks, and a down quark. And for the neutron, that is just um, two downs and one up. OK, so that means um, our normal matter is made up uh, out of an electron, an up and down quarks. Now, in fact, for that first family, there's one that particle that we tend to forget because um, it is a little bit elusive, and that is the neutrino, which in fact was postulated um, to um, recover um, energy conservation in weak um, radioactive decays. So those four particles sort of make up the first family and that make up everything around us, you, me, um, this microphone, the computer, most of the universe. But we now actually also know that funnily enough, we do not only have this uh, first family, we have copies of those, we have three families in fact, and those copies are just heavier versions of those particles. Okay? So the electron has a heavier brother, which is the muon, uh, which in, in, in turn um, has a heavier sister, which is the tau lepton. Okay? And similarly for the, for the other, other um, um, particles in there. Now, many of those particles we have known for a while, so the electron uh, was discovered by Thomson a very, very long, very long time ago. The most recent discoveries were the top quark in the mid-90s, which is in fact the heaviest particle that we know, about 175 times heavier than, the, than a proton, and the tau neutrino, which uh, was quite a little bit elusive and was found somewhere in the mid-2000s. Well, those are the metaparticles, but there are forces between the particles, right? So what are the known, known forces? Well, there's the strong force, which as the name suggests actually is strong, and is connecting, um, binding the nucleons inside the nucleus together, binding the quarks together to form protons uh, and neutrons, and binding, in fact, neutrons and protons together as well. Um, and the way we are thinking of forces actually is as forces being exchanged by our exchange particles. Okay? So the way this works is if I'm throwing a heavy ball towards you, I will recoil. Once you catch the ball, you will recoil, and we have created a repulsive force between us. Now, if you want to have an attractive force, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, you can go the way as some of my colleagues go here with a wall, or um, a little bit more poetic as I usually like to see it, where I'm throwing a ball into uh, plus infinity, 
and you are catching it from minus infinity, and uh, that way we have an, have an attractive force in there. Okay, so those force carriers for the strong force are the gluons. Um, this being EMF for the electromagnetic field and therefore the electromagnetic force, the, the um, 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 carrying quanta is a photon, okay? And electromagnetism is a kind of thing uh, that produces light. In fact, light is photons, okay? Uh, the thing that keeps the electron uh, um, in the atom is responsible for chemistry and most importantly is keeping me on this surface so that I'm not, not sinking in. Then there is a weak force and um, that is radioactive decay. What is responsible there are relatively heavy weak bosons, the W and the Z, and they are in fact so heavy that they are about 80 to 90 times heavier than, uh, than a proton. And there's another force that in everyday life we actually lately sink off for almost granted, which is gravity, but in fact we, we have a very hard time understanding how we can put gravity into a quantum theory. So there have been some progresses made, but it's still um, a difficult thing. And if there would be a force carrier of gravity, that would be the gravitino, but we haven't seen the, uh, the graviton, but we haven't seen that yet. Okay. Now, all of those is what we call, call bosons, which comes from, from a property that um, behaves essentially like a spin, it has the same, same um, exchange properties, and those bosons have an integer spin, and that's what makes these particles. And also, for example, the Higgs boson is a boson. Now, if you put all of those, those matter and, and force uh, particles together, we get what we, we particle physicists call the standard model, and that is sort of describing all the forces, all the interactions between particles around us. And for like over 50 years, uh, people have been trying to poke holes into that theory, and we haven't really found any major ones. Right? There was one, one snack that for that theory to work, um, the W and the Z bosons needed to be massless, and they clearly weren't, was having a mass of um, 80 to 90 times the proton mass. And the way around this was a very elegant mechanism proposed by these guys in the 60s, um, it's sort of uh, um, very difficult uh, if you are the only person that, that proposed a particle, but you have actually a number of people that really laid, laid the groundwork for that, and then suddenly everybody is only talking about the Higgs boson, whereas, uh, you know, a lot of us actually we try to call it the, you know, Guralnik brown angular higgs particle. But that mechanism um, created a field um, the Higgs field here, and that Higgs field, um, the interactions with that field would be creating mass. It's kind of a friction, and that friction is slowing, slowing the particles down, is creating the, the equivalent of a mass. And it also so happens that the excitations of that field would produce a boson, the Higgs boson. Now, the nice thing about that theory is that actually it predicted almost everything. So we have now, now particles that we think we know very well. We know what possible decay options it can have. And you can see here, here on, the, on the right side, depending on the mass of the boson, or on the mass of that Higgs particle, what are the possibilities that it can actually decay? I mean, the Higgs giving mass is decaying to, uh, is coupling to mass, meaning it should be decaying into the heaviest particle that is available to it. Okay? In fact, at a mass of about 125 um, GeV, don't worry about the units, um, it, it should decay mostly into a pair of bottom quarks because that is the heaviest kind of, kind of particle uh, um, available. So top quark is too heavy um, and the other, other particles are lighter. So the only thing that was not predicted was actually the mass of the Higgs itself. So we had to look everywhere. Well, as I said, proposed in the, the uh, uh, mid-60s, searched for at literally every single particle collider ever since, but finally, Q's a Large Hadron Collider. Now the question is, why are we looking for these things at actually particle colliders? And there's sort of uh, um, um, Einstein's most famous equation, energy equals mass uh, speed of light squared, probably on, one of the few equations that you might find in almost any popular science book. There's only one, one equation usually. What does it mean? 
that if you're colliding particles, you're creating a blob of energy, and that blob of energy can in turn itself into other massive particles. If you think of that instead of real life waves, you have two strawberries flying into each other and creating a bunch of pears flying out. Uh, at the LHC, those two strawberries are actually two, actually two protons, so two hydrogen nuclei, and we are creating a bunch of new particles um, um, coming out of that. That is why, why I support so poetically said, creating that energy uh, density, recreating the conditions of the Big Bang is what I do. Even though mostly I make code compile. So how do we get those particles actually to those speeds? And what we, we do is, well, using the electromagnetic field and the electromagnetic force. So the simplest way that you can think of that is that we actually just have an electrode with a high, high voltage, a proton being positively charged, would be attracted to the negative electrode and therefore accelerate and gain um, velocity and energy. In reality, what we actually use is a radio cavity and a radio wave, and you can sort of think of, of uh, um, the charged particles um, surfing along the peaks, peaks and troughs of that wave and getting accelerated to very close to the speed of light. Now, what does a Large Hadron Collider actually look like? So that's sort of a, um, a schema here where you see that there is um, a big tube underground and there are several places where actually the beams cross and we are colliding the particles. And if you're not particularly impressed with the, with this, um, with the drawing like that, I also have a real, real life picture for you. Uh, what you see, see in the background here um, are actually the French Alps, uh, Lake Geneva, and um, if you look closely somewhere here, that is actually the Geneva airport, okay? Just to give you an idea about size. Now, the whole um, ring is about 27 kilometers in circumference, or as my London colleagues tell me, roughly the length of the circle line, but the circle line has a lot more delays than this. Okay, so on those collider, um, we have a number of, of experiments, um, detectors, where we are looking at those collisions. One of those is ATLAS. You can see that here underground, um, where the, the ring is coming and protons are coming from one side and from the other. But ATLAS is actually also an international collaboration. I have 3,500 colleagues, if you look, from all over the world, and in fact also from all over the UK. Okay. Um, if you look at the bottom picture, I think I'm somewhere um, in the, the top, top uh, right, but uh, you'll probably have a hard time finding me. But uh, working together with that many people with very different um, um, backgrounds um, is actually quite challenging, but also extremely interesting. So, back to ATLAS as a particle detector. So, um, the way we actually look at these collisions is by having um, this rather large area um, quite detailed instrumented. And we start, we have sort of a kind of shell structure, uh, so you see that there are protons coming from either side, colliding in the middle, and it's in that innermost part is where we have a tracking detector. That, in fact, is um, usually a silicon detector with a very similar technology as the camera on your mobile phone, in fact. That's, in fact, what I was working on. Except that that, that camera um, has about 100 mega, megapixels, is about uh, um, 50, 50 um, um, centimeters um, in diameter and about a meter and a half long, okay. and has to take pictures about 40 million times every second. Mm. So that is followed um, by a magnet that we keep uh, um, the tracker immersed in followed by what we call a calorimeter, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Then if you look to the outside, where we again have um, some very fancy magnets and muon chambers, because as it turns out, the muons are the only particles that can actually travel that far. To give you an idea for, for, for size, that's about 50 meters long and 25 meters high, and if you look on that side there, you see there are two people um, standing to give you a rough idea, idea, idea for size. But again, you don't have to believe the drawing, so that's a picture. So that's a rather old picture, but actually I prefer the old picture that's taken during the construction where you could actually still see something of the structure of the detector. What you're mostly seeing on the outside here, uh, um, these things with the, with the red bands, those are in fact superconducting magnets to allow measuring um, the muons a bit. 
And again, there's a person to give you an idea about size. Okay. Now the big question is, how do those detectors in general actually work? How do we actually trace charged particles passing through there? Well, the secret is ionization. What is ionization? If you have a heavy charged particle, that will knock off an electron off an atom, as you see in the um, um, top right corner there. And by knocking several electrons, it will lose energy. Okay, it will lose most of its energy, transferring the energy to those electrons, and in turn, ionize those atoms. Okay. Now, with that mechanism, we can use that to actually trace our particles. In the good old days, we would use um, a cloud chamber, for example, as you can see at the bottom right there, where the charged particles are sort of leaving a trace, similarly as a cloud trail that a plane would leave, leave in the sky, but Nowadays, in particular, to read out uh, 40 million times every second, what we need are electronic detectors, and what we are using are silicon detectors, where a passing through particles actually generating a pulse. Now, uh, ionization, in fact, is also um, the magic, if you so want, behind um, um, proton beam therapy, where we can use a very dedicated um, a mechanism to treat cancer or treat um, localized um, and tumors, and as you might know, in the UK there are currently um, um, two places where we are building um, um, proton beam centers. One is in London, the other one, one is in Manchester. Okay. Now, the problem now is that if you have particles passing, actually what we can't, what, what we measure is not really the, the trajectory of the particles, but just where they are passing through our sensitive uh, um, elements. You can sort of see that in white here, and we then need to actually connect those white dots to actually um, follow the trajectory of the particle. In a picture like that, that's fairly straightforward. And one of the things that you will, will um, realize, probably, is that the particles are actually being curved. Okay? So the reason for that is that they are charged particles inside a magnetic field. And that gives us an advantage, because that way we can actually measure the momentum or the speed of those particles. Think of it. If you're playing soccer, if you're like me, on a windy day, I essentially have zero chance of hitting the goal because I shoot very, very feebly. The wind will drift the ball, ball, ball away. It will, not, it will miss the goal. If you have a proper soccer player, they will hit the ball with a lot of velocity. It will go almost straight into the goal. Similarly here, the higher the speed, the more straighter the trajectory, therefore by the bending of the trajectory, we can actually measure the speed of the particles. Okay. As I said, we can stop particles and measure their energy, and what we usually do is, when we stop them in structures like this, um, they actually create um, a kind of shower, and that shower uh, um, creates light, and that light uh, is proportional to the amount of, of energy that they have and that we can measure. It's not always that easy, because there are often a lot of those trajectories. And as I said, what we actually measure is not the trajectory, but just the hits of the particles. Well, fortunately, we have a lot of computers available. Okay? And in fact, CERN is one, one of the big computing centers in the world. And just to sort of, sort of hammer an old story, story home, uh, that's, that's a place where um, particle physicists, in fact, invented the World Wide Web. <laughs> You can still see, see um, a not so shiny um, um, plaque uh, somewhere down in the hallways of CERN where um, Sir Bernhard Lee started off the first um, um, web server. And I suspect most of you are, are too young to actually remember the very first web page there. But in fact, we not only have one center, we have computers all over the world because with the amount of data, as I said, we have about 100 megapixel camera, 50, um, 40 million collisions every second, that is a lot of data. So storing that data, analyzing that data requires a lot of computing. Some of that actually is done very cleverly already on the experiment, so we design our own ships to really do some, some of that processing in the detector itself, but still the amount of data that we store and move is rather large. And uh, what other people might know as the cloud, for us is a grid of computers where everywhere in the world, essentially every university that's doing particle physics um, um, is having, having a, a connected cluster. We also need clever algorithms. 
And while machine learning neural nets sort of started um, um, sprouting up in, in particle physics somewhere, somewhere in the 90s, in the early 90s, um, it recently has become a more mainstream stream kind of tool to use. Now, if you put all of those all of this together, um, what are the various signatures that we can find? The easiest that we can do is reconstruct leptons, meaning an electron, a muon, to a lesser, lesser extent, extent a tau particle, where we more or less can connect a track in the inner, in the inner tracker um, with a blob in the colorimeters and thereby identify those particles. So there are other, other signatures, so jets, which are, we can measure in the inner tracker and the colorimeter, um, missing energy, so there's momentum conservation when we collide the particles in the transverse plane. So if we have particles shooting off in one direction and nothing in the other, that means they have to, those un invisible particles have to balance um, the measured particles. So there are particular kind of, kind of jets, and B-jets, and in particular, let's say we can put um, and the quantities of all of those together and uh, reconstruct um, the possible mass of a decaying particle. Think of it if you have a coil where on both ends you have a marble attached. Okay? If you have a strong coil, those marbles will go much faster than if you have a, if you have a weak spring, those marbles will not, not go very fast. Similarly, we can, can determine the mass. With that, um, there was a discovery, so you see that there are excesses in the masses um, of those decay products that were predicted, okay? and in particular that there was a Nobel, Nobel Prize given. But that is sort of just the backstory to actually what I want to talk about. Is now we found the Higgs, where do we go next? Right? That was in 2012, that is six years ago, what have we been up to? Well, the important thing to understand is if you find a new particle, you actually probably spend the next decade understanding what you have found, okay? Because you need to really be sure that all the properties are as predicted and that there are no deviations because that could lead to something excitingly new, okay? So, in particular, um, if you look, um, the, the most probable decay of the Higgs boson was into um, a BB bar pair a bottom anti-bottom anti -bottom quark pair, which should be most copiously uh, produced in the Higgs decay. In reality, uh, that wasn't used in the, in the discovery, and we only had a few years ago some indication that that was really happening. In fact, only about a week ago do we have um, a real starting to be precision measurement of that process. And the problem essentially is that a pair of bottom quarks are strong interacting particles, which means they get strongly produced by other mechanisms, and finding that Higgs decay is sort of finding a needle, needle in, a, in, in a haystack. Now, the way to get, get, get around to, of, of that is you try to make your, make your needle glow, glow, glow and blink, and the way we do that is we, we have an additional signature of an additional um, MZ boson there, and if you look, look on the right, you see those two blue blue cones, that is the Higgs boson decaying into those two B-jets, and then there are two dark blue, blue uh, um, lines. These are two electrons from the additional signature, which makes that possible. Well, but is that everything? Okay. Um, in addition to, to the Higgs, are there any other problems that we have to deal with? Well, yeah. Um, in particular, on the Higgs itself, not everything thing, thing is fully under, understood yet, and we might need additional theory to sort of help, help with that. If you look, up, look around you, almost everything is made out of matter. So according to the Big Bang, things should have been created in matter-antimatter pairs, where is the antimatter gone? Gravity, we deal with that every day, not in particle physics, so better we find a way to actually include that. And I saw a nice book by, by, by Penrose on one of, one of the, the, the exchange tables, but I think it's gone by now. And then the big question is, did we forget anything? And yes, our universe says yes. There's dark matter, okay? So dark matter, the universe can't even be bothered to interact with you. There is matter that doesn't like to interact very much. What you see here is a picture of the bullet cluster where we take three different measurements. That's what we see, okay? There's uh, um, the heat generated, or the X-rays in this case, when 
um, normal matter particles are sort of interacting with each other, kind of the friction kind of thing. And then we found with this um, um, gravitational lensing, those blue blobs, where it looks like of those two colliding galaxies, there are some parts that actually just march through, through each other. And that is what we think is dark matter. In fact, those of you that arrived here on Friday, um, you might have listened um, um, to everything about dark matter uh, from a colleague of mine. So you might already be experts, but let me uh, remind you a bit. So the reason that we think that there is dark matter essentially was first proposed by Fritz Zwicky somewhere, somewhere in the 30s, and then by precision measurements by Vera, Vera Rubin of the rotation curves of galaxies. Okay? Essentially, um, if you think of, of the speed of the speed of a, of a conquer that you're, that you're twirling, that is determined by the force by which you're holding it. Right? The stronger you hold it, the faster you, you can twirl it. And that force, in fact, is given by the mass in it in case of a galaxy, right? It's gravity that is holding things together. So from, from normal theory, what you would, would expect from, from the mass that you see is that um, um, rotation speed to actually go down, but what we see is that it stays constant, so there must be a halo of dark matter to hold it. In fact, we now have supporting a very strong evidence from fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background that tell us that, in fact, the matter that we know is actually just a tiny fraction, just 5%. Okay. The standard model, the particle needs to not interact very much. The standard model can't actually provide that, so all the standard model particles fall, fall out of there, which means we need to look for something new. The way we can do that is um, if we have some interaction with the particles that we know, we can make it, break it, or shake it, Making it mean we are colliding standard model particles at the LHC, for, for example, and create dark matter particles. Um, we can shake it. That's, in fact, what my colleagues in uh, direct detection do, where we have a, a dark matter particle hitting a nucleus, and that nucleus is flying, flying away. Or in the universe, maybe there's dark matter colliding um, and annihilating, creating uh, um, you know, normal matter particles or dark matter decaying, so breaking. So the way we would normally envision that is with a Feynman diagram. I apologize for that, but the way to think of that is that it's a diagram where you have particles coming in, a mediator in the middle, and particles going out. And the problem is, if you only create dark matter in a collider experiment, you wouldn't see anything because the dark matter doesn't actually interact with the detector. But if you're creating something else, then we might see that signature so, in fact, we might see some visible, some visible particles um, flying in one direction and recoiling by a dark matter particle. Also possible that such a mediator then decays again into the original um, um, standard model matter particles that we know, and that would create or, uh, um, such, a, such an event of two, of two digests. And, in fact, that is one of the, the highest um, energy events that we have observed at the, at the LHC, but in fact that is in accordance with um, the, the theories that we have. And I think I'm out of time, but I wanted to give you, give you um, a few chances uh, um, to get possibly involved. In fact, there is data available, so you can have a look yourself. Um, there are challenges to try and identify um, various signatures at the LHC, and there are substantial price man money available. These are past challenges, but there are future, future challenges coming. Um, there is a possibility to get together with people from CERN to work on humanitarian uh, um, uh, missions. And last but not least, a really shameless plug, a colleague of mine that couldn't quite quite make it to be here, has actually written a very, very nice book um, as a layman's introduction into particle physics. So if that is your thing, have a look. Thank you.